we're going to start this panel and um, this is a web, um, uh, a Zoom uh, uh, cast. So we would ask people to um, mute themselves if there's a lot of noise or, and um, if you would like to keep your video on, that's great. We'd love to have your video on as people that speak and want to see human beings. Um, and so I'm going, I'm Ann Lewis and I'm going to just introduce the panel briefly. And then we're going to move into a fairly informal um, conversation about uh, what is going on and what we what we see as a possible brighter future. Um, so um, let me read in the interest of time um, some some remarks, and then and then we'll move into something more integrated. Um, first of all, welcome um, welcome and thanks to the Rappaport Center. Um, and my colleagues there and all of its many workers. Um, I honor the place where we sit on stolen land and I honor all the workers who've constructed the products that we now use to talk with each other about workers. Much of the typical examination of art and its place in a neoliberal economy or what this pop-up institute has called a world of racial capitalism has concentrated on money how is art funded? How does it contribute to the economy? How is it sold and who buys it? And then the impact of those on the artist living or dead or the artistic endeavor. And so we enter a world of bourgeois depravity um, with the example of the 2017 sale of a Basquiat painting entitled Untitled, nearly 20 years after the artist's death from a heroin overdose at age 27, for more than 110 million to a private firm, to a private home. The funding world is equally disturbing, determined by austerity and commercial value instead of the social value of the artistic product or experience. Of course, social value is hard to quantify into funding other than need. And what of the art that surrounds us, construction workers who sing on the job, public art from graffiti to murals, the digital forms of TikTok, love poems, iPhone photos, flowers, the occasional storm or protest, I'm guilty of this. Um, this stuff, when it's authentic and of quality, fits into the category folk art and may be curated, funded, and sold in a similar fashion. We generally try to uncover social value by ex examining artistic content and context, but that's also problematic. John Berger has us watch a, a fine symphony played by men and women women in uniform, first British, then German Nazi, and their respective audiences. We observe the same level of skill on the part of the players and pleasure and even spirituality in the faces of the audience. But this first part of the panel, while it takes on the entirety of production, takes as its core question artistic labor. It's an attempt to put the painting back on the easel, the dancers back in the practice studio and make visible all of the workers who surround and collaborate and are usually invisible and exposed only by their mistakes. Artistic labor has been clobbered by the pandemic. 2.7 million jobs in the US lost in the creative occupations with disproportionate impact in the performing arts and black, brown and community-based artists. For example, dancers have gone from slightly over 10% to over 50% unemployment actors from 25% to over 50%. Those starting numbers show how the pandemic not only reveals but exaggerates the existing problems of artistic labor, on a chronic unemployment, contingency, lack of a social safety net, low pay, overwork, and vast inequalities. Nearly every artist by necessity makes their livelihood in large part outside of the arts, teaching, waiting tables, driving Uber, and so on. John Berger, um, to return to him, tells a folk story of a cave of gold where, from which no one returns. A young piper is asked to pick between wealth and fame on the one hand and the ability to play beautifully for his people on the other. He answers without hesitation the second and in return is given both for a year. After the year, he returns to the cave leaving the many people who love and admire him at the mouth unable to defend himself against a monster. He plays beautifully, if increasingly faintly, and then he and his art disappear. 
this is a time when those of us in the arts and humanities find ourselves in a very dark cave ruled by profit. We cannot simply expose our material and social realities and expect them to change. We must also imagine and work together for a brighter world. So I asked the panel to consider, reveal, and imagine. We begin with three working artists here in Austin. They've requested a more informal conversation because they have a great deal in common and some differences. All are remarkable collaborative artists, collaborative both with other artists and their communities all work in the area of mural and public art. Um, Lisa, uh, can you put in um, the descriptions? And I, I would like um, now to introduce um, Raisin, uh, Carmen, and Jay um, as, as speakers to take it away. So um, Raisin, would you like to go first? I think we're going to start with funding. Um, as a basic question, and then move into your process. But let's let's talk about funding for a moment. Uh, you have to unmute. I can't believe I'm not used to this by now after a whole year of pandemic. <laughs> it still gets me every so often. Um, thank you, Anne. You know what? Thank you, Raisin. I'm going to interrupt just for a second. <laughs> let's um, let's begin with a quick check in. Just okay. because for me, that's important. Just to say, what have you been doing today? What are you thinking about today? And how are you doing? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'd like to call it, I think Jay is a little, uh, Jay and Carmen are familiar with this type of approach, which is, we call it a, a communal check-in or check-in, right? Check-in model to understand where everybody's space is, right? To kind of take in or to kind of see and feel where a person is to be able to receive a lot of the messages that are going out. So I really appreciate that, Anne. Thank you so much. I'm happy to be here today, to be alive, um, to be a creative, right? And to be able to, um, or just to have a chance to serve, right? Um, and, and to do my passion. And so I'm in a really powerful place in terms of self-love right now and taking care of myself and understanding that that's the most, the best way that I could really be a change for the better for others or to help others, right? And so uh, it took a while to get there, but I'm understanding more and more that um, I have to be okay in order to help others. And so um, familiar wise, I'm doing really well. Family is healthy. Um, my partner just, she broke her leg on a scooter accident, but she's alive and she's recovering. And so uh, I had to take a lot on in the last couple of uh, weeks. Uh, but I'm, I'm good. And then community wise, I think uh, we're resilient. We're doing projects, art projects, we're working together, we're looking at the future and how to really just be a voice for the community through the uh, arts and the platform of environmental justice. So I'm truly excited today to be here to talk a little bit about my journey and to also correlate that and connect that with the journey of, of Jay and Carmen, which we are, we work a lot together on projects. So thank you so much for having me. I'm gonna pass it over to Jay. <laughs> thank you, Raisin. It's good to see everyone. And thank you, Anne and the Rappaport Center again for having us and for facilitating this important conversation, often overlooked conversation, that unless you're an artist, you probably don't know the plight, <laughs> but uh, we'll get deeper into that later. Um, yeah, I'm coming at you from the studio. This is my uh, my cave, <laughs> as it were, uh, in something cool studios. It's a it's a collective of artists, uh, five or six at a time, in a hundred year old house in East Cesar Chavez neighborhood, uh, trying to sort of plant here, um, continually displaced out of spaces um, with the increasing rent and whatnot. And luckily, uh, one of our partner artists here and his family was able to invest in the property and set some roots. So hopefully we're not going anywhere for a while. And with that regard, we're all very much involved in community-based artwork and trying to lift up the community, lift, you know, give artists opportunity to make their work, to sell their work uh, and create a sustainable economy for creatives here in Austin. So um, yeah, and um, we also host the Mosaic Workshop here and that's kind of a little bit more about what we're gonna talk about later. Um, but yeah, I'll send it over to Carmen to continue the check-ins. Hi, uh, thanks everyone for having me here today. And I wanna thank you, Anne, for that 
um, introduction for setting the scene. I think that it's really important for everyone to kind of know where um, arts and culture is right now in society, in society with everything going on, and especially um, just sharing the experiences and the hardships that artists are facing right now. Um, so yeah, I'm an artist and muralist and also co-founder of the Mosaic Workshop and I helped Jay run it. Um, and I've been really fortunate enough to work on a lot of mural projects with Raisin as well, or her organization, which I've had so much fun doing. Um, so yeah, uh, today's been great. I have some work to do, but it feels like, it actually feels like a Friday, <laughs> which is awesome. And whenever I have some free time, I like to like work on stuff on my house. So I painted this wall behind me green the other day. And so we're painting the rest of the walls today an off-white and we started this morning. So if I moved my camera over, you'd see the mess of paint that's going on over here. <laughs> um, so yeah, working on that today, that'll be really fun and exciting. And Jay and I will be working on a big project this weekend, finishing it up. And we are actually, I mean, fingers crossed, we stay on schedule, but things are looking good right now. So thanks for having me. I think you're on mute, Ann. Uh, let's talk about money for a few minutes and uh, current situation. So let's do a round now on um, uh, funding and um, a little bit more about that. And you can be specific about a piece of work if you would like. Absolutely, I'll take it away, Jane <laughs> Corbin. Okay. okay. Um, so I'm a little, I mean, there's a lot of similarities between Jay and Carmen and I, but there's also a lot of differences here. Um, not more so on the visual implementation and muralist side, I'm more so on the creative organizational side and really trying to provide opportunities within the city, within the community to be able to give creatives opportunity to display their work, give voices to the community and so forth. Uh, so my perspective from the funding may, may be a little different, I'm not sure, but uh, we are, I will say for art organizations, it's, it's becoming increasingly difficult to get funding, right? Um, I would have to say that now we find the funding to do these projects, but I just feel like it should be a lot easier and a lot more available, accessible. Uh, for organizations like Raising in the Sun and many others here in the city and abroad to be able to get these fundings. And so a lot of times I look at it like a pie chart um, in really founding and creating our organization and understanding a percentage of energy goes to trying to do grants, which you only get so much back from that, right? Uh, a percentage should go from real support from city um, and then a portion of it should come from, uh, I think just people just giving, right. Or private donors of some sort. Um, and in that pie chart, you know, I must say the majority from our organization, Raising in the Sun, and I think Ann put our link in there, you can kind of look at our organization on the website, has come from grant funding. Um, why? Because I was teaching for 15 years taught English as a second language and I just know how to write. Uh, <laughs> so I've learned how to like articulate the, the types of work and the projects that we do in order to get people interested and, and um, willing to fund, right? And we've just been building ever since on the ground grassroots for about five years. So I don't, I don't know, what do you think, Jay? Or Car I mean, for the most part, for me, that's, <laughs> that's what it is. It's, we get some people that are sponsored or other organizations that will help us write the grants or that will just kind of get bring in uh, funding that like for instance if an organization in the community has core funding from the city they will filter that out to other grassroots organizations that are trying to do projects but other than that I would say the majority would come from grants you know, uh, I, one of the problems right now in the city of Austin for independent artists, and you know, I'm also one, um, is uh, that the city funding is based on hotel and restaurant taxes, um, uh, uh, tourism, basically. 
um, which has been really hit hard during the pandemic, but still it's a strange basis. Yes, absolutely. A great point. Great point. But I, I, I think at the end of the day, to your point, there needs to be something done on a higher level to realize the value right? <laughs> the value that creatives bring to the city and how we are essential in preserving the culture, right? There's a lot of change going on. I, I mean, I'm not really sure who's all on the call, but I know if you've been in Austin more than two years, you've seen a significant amount of change. If you've been 10 years and then 20 and 30, you've been blown away. And I think as that change happens, it's not a lot of the culture preservation that I would like to see. And it's not a lot of uplifting of the creatives. And I, yeah, I do advocate for creatives. I do. And I'm not afraid to do it, you know? Um, and I'm finding ourselves, and I know Jane Farman, we're finding ourselves more and more often in the positions to give voice to other creatives because it's, you know, it's discouraging right? To see that we have to depend solely on grant funding. That's, a, you know, not every time always available for us if we get picked for the grants or not, or even applying for the project. So that's just my perspective on it. Yeah. Um, I mean, I've got uh, some bullet points here. When you talk about funding, I can list out all the ways that things are funded and, you know, like, like Raisin said, a pie chart would be helpful to see. Maybe I should make one of those for the next uh, panel. But, you know, you've got crowdfunding, you've got grants, you've got donations from individuals, you've got self, the self volunteering time and materials. You've got looking at alternative materials and methods to do something because your budget is so low, because you haven't ever, you know, been able to get uh, sufficient funding for a project. And then you've got commercial and public art. Um, so we've got, um, I don't know if this is the, the right time or now maybe in a little bit, we've got a, a short slideshow from the Mosaic Workshop about sort of these different projects and, and the different ways they've been funded. So you can kind of see, and we can talk through a little bit, you know, with a visual cue, it might help for people to understand a little more. But yeah, essentially what Raisin was saying is absolutely true. It's like the grants and the city funding are exclusive. They're exclusive to people who know how to write a grant, who know how to find them, who have partners willing to partner to do the project. Um, a good example is uh, one that Raisin and I wrote um, last year to get uh, involved with the Philadelphia Mural Arts Project, which if anybody knows anything about mural arts, you know they're the best in town, well, around, they're world renowned, and um, they have increasingly tried to build capacity for people doing similar things in other areas across the country, and so we applied and were, it was a very competitive thing, but we were lucky enough to be one of uh, just three recipients across the country to, to kind of be taken under their wing for two years and, and they help us through training and, and, and also some financial support to do some, some monumental mur uh, mural arts projects for Austin. But if Raisin and I hadn't come together as a partnership and we also had to bring uh, another East Austin Environmental Initiative aspect to that because it was specifically for this environmental um, initiative that they were trying to fund. So if, if we didn't know like where those people were and how to work together, you know, that collaboration took weeks in the making, you know, well, well weeks to write the grant, months in the making really, years of experience of just knowing who's around in Austin. So that's not available to, you know, a newer artist to town, for example, or even someone who just hasn't been, uh, you know, educated on the way that, that things are funded. And so I think the grants are very exclusive, as are the public art projects and the city funding. Um, so then it comes down to, OK, well, then you're searching out commercial gigs, you know, for your day to day. And, and you're probably having to bargain with people who are trying to undervalue your work and they're trying to undercut your price, um, you know, because it's, it would be really nice to tell them what it costs and they just write you a check. But rarely does that happen. Right. Usually they're like, oh, but this, this and this. And there's always this, you know, this like compromise and the artist usually ends up doing it for less than what it's worth. And they feel a little bit cheated, you know, and they feel kind of overworked and underpaid. And it's just, it's notorious in our industry. And there, you know, I could go off on a whole soapbox about there's no standard. Uh, I, I think we need an artist union in, in Austin and maybe this is the right forum to voice that because if we had an association to like standardize rates and to tell people, hey, artists don't work for free, including design work like that's our time and labor and creative energy and people always want free designs before they even give you a deposit check for a mural and i'm like that's ludicrous 
you, there's no industry where you ask people to work for free, right? <laughs> in our in our capitalist society so if that's what we're basing it on that we're in a capitalist economy right then that doesn't fly and so with time and again carmen raisin and myself and all the other muralists in town have to educate clients on why this is valuable why you're paying for our design time why you're you know um and so so yeah that's a whole that's a whole nother side thing um carmen you might have a, an example of that just from a personal mural project i don't know that you could think of recently um, well, <laughs> um, I agree with what Jay was saying about how it's great that they have these resources, you know, there's these grants that you can apply to, and there's all this funding, but it's, it never seems enough. And I, and yeah, they're inaccessible. They're very difficult to find. Um, it's hard for everyone, um, to be able to do that. Not everyone has the capacity to write a grant. And I think that, um, one of the things that I've noticed is I, I don't think that people understand how much work goes into creating artwork, especially public artwork. So we're getting getting this funding, like with projects that I've worked on with Raisin, like it's awesome that I'm able to get paid to create artwork because that's like my dream and uh, projects that we're doing with the Mosaic Workshop as well. But I, I think that a lot of people don't understand how much materials cost how much um, research you're doing on your own time, designing um, mileage to get there back and forth, any other uh, things that arise while you're working on a project. And so by the end of it, you don't, you're not really making that much profit. And if you think about it, kind of what Jay was saying, how we need to have some kind of union for artists, like artists aren't able to uh, get health care as easily, aren't able to access insurance. We have to pay for our own business insurance, all of these overhead costs, which make it really difficult to actually be able to make a profit, especially in a city like this, because, you know, rent costs, studio costs, all of that. So there's definitely a lot that, uh, a lot of changes that we need. And I think what what Raisin said is we need people to understand the value and importance of art. It would be great if we could move into, um, I don't know if, um, Jay, you have um, work that you can show us. I think it would be great to have a, a brief interlude of work and then continue on. Absolutely. I'll just share my screen. I've got this. Uh, this is just kind of a standard uh, Mosaic Workshop presentation. We'll actually use this oftentimes uh, when Carmen or myself, uh, when we go to do a pop-up, like at a school or an event, and just to kind of tell people more about what we do. Um, but essentially, yeah, here we go. So that's us. That's where we're located. And if, if, if anybody hasn't been by um, to the studio, definitely come and check us out. It's not only the Mosaic Workshop, like I mentioned, there's five other artists um, and in the collective and there's a lot of cool stuff we're doing. We're trying to have openings every month now that COVID's lightening up. So, um, so yeah, definitely come and check us out. Um, this is like a general kind of um, one way we quantify our work. So uh, another big difference is um, between our organizations and Raising in the Sun and the Mosaic Workshop is Raising in the Sun is, is an official nonprofit with a board. And so they're able to get funding as a, as a 501c3. We're actually just umbrellaed under my own personal uh, studio name that I made a few years ago with my art business. So we're, you know, DBA is the Mosaic Workshop. But then we're not, you know, we're not going to be able to uh, receive a lot of the same grant funding because we're not a 501c3. Um, so that, you know, there's pros and cons of that. And we like to do a lot of free and low-cost community-based workshops like you can see here at the Mexican American Cultural Center or in the studio. Um, but to subsidize that, we've got to have some kind of funding. So then we also do like a, you know, a $45 per person workshop for those who are able to pay that. And then we can, you know, make some, some money there. And any profit that we do make kind of goes back into those free and subsidized workshops. So it's kind of like more like a B corporation or something if you're familiar with that. Um, but the murals and public art is really both myself and Carmen's passion. That's really why we got into this work in the first place. And to go a little further back, I've been a muralist for 20 years and actually come out of graffiti and street art. I uh, got into painting murals. And then only the, over the last five years have we actually been doing mosaic. So, um, and Carmen and I met through a mosaic project actually in 2017 or 18. Um, so here's an example of the La Mujer um, mural we're creating at the Mexican American Cultural Center, which has actually been on hold because of COVID. It hasn't been able to be installed. It's actually pretty much completed except for installation. 
Um, and that was a program where the city site, the Mexican American Cultural Center invited me to be a mural mentor and they paid the, the uh, standard city you know, rate, which is decent, but not great. Um, and I would just go every Saturday for you know, eight months and work on this thing with the, with the students there. Um, so that was you know, paid through the city through like an hourly wage. Uh, and then they, they covered the materials, which was nice. Um, this was Carmen and I's first um, public mural as the Mosaic Workshop back in 2019 of Roosevelt Williams, The Great Ghost. I'm really proud of this project. We're both really proud of this project because it was participant led. We basically opened up the studio for teaching the basics of mosaic art and just art in general as a discussion and, and collaborative workspace. And we had no concept or you know, what would come out of the workshop. Um, we did have these walls available, so we showed that to the participants and through conversation, uh, they, the participants decided on East Austin music and specifically Roosevelt Williams because we had this awesome picture of him and, and permission to use it that was taken by a local photographer. So over eight weeks in the studio, um, uh, uh, oh, to backtrack a little bit, what was the impetus for this workshop was a community initiative grant from the city. It's a, it's a two or $3,000 grant um, that you can get every year uh, if, you're, if you're doing a public facing free event. So that's how we posed it, that, that the public could come to our studio and we would give you instruction for free and the materials are there um, and you can come and learn mosaic art. Now we were very ambitious because <laughs> over that eight weeks we spent well over $3,000 on materials alone. So we were not able to pay ourselves through that grant uh, Carmen and I essentially ended up volunteering all our time, <laughs> which eight weeks is a long time to be volunteering. Uh, and we have, but we have this awesome thing to show for it, right? We did the budget on this and we actually, you know, kept person hours of work and studio overhead and materials and all that. This was a $21,000 project. So it's a 12 by 16 foot, very intricate mosaic mural, very technical. Okay. Um, you know, in the public art world, this would be a thirty dollars or $40,000 project. We did it for $3,000. Um, so we did get some donations of materials. And obviously, a lot of the person hours were donated from participants. And it was that reciprocal exchange of skills for labor, essentially. But I don't know how sustainable that is, because Carmen and I both couldn't pay the rent at the end of that <laughs> program. Um, so that's, that's kind of a, that's kind of a, you know, what, what we're trying to figure out a better way to do that uh, in the future. And and I think um, the project we're doing now with Latanitas that we're hopefully finishing this weekend is, is, a, is a step in the right direction. We're, we're partnering with some other organizations who have their own funding and we're able to sponsor it for closer to what the actual cost should be. Um, I'll give you a couple more visuals and just kind of uh, the other example of the public art commissions. Um, for those of you that uh, aren't aware, these are open art calls that essentially uh, outline the space and the scope of work and sometimes even the themes they're looking for and the budget. So all the information is there for you. You can, and as an artist, you can apply with a design or if you say, oh, that budget's not enough, you can, you know, go on to the next. The problem with that is, and I'll sh showing this one on the screen is a great example. This is in the municipal courthouse in Georgetown and it was a public art call. And I had this concept that I wanted to try out with this mosaic glass uh, mural and with the pixelated style. And I, it was a $5,000 budget. And if anybody knows anything about glass costs, there's more than $5,000 of glass alone on this thing. Not to mention the three months of labor that it took to, to fabricate it uh, on my own. Cause at the time I didn't have a process and I couldn't invite anyone to help me on it. So this was, this was a $5,000 project that should have been, you know, five times that at least. Um, so that's another problem and issue with the public art funding is that their, their budgets they offer, you know, sometimes they look good at first. And then when you realize, like Carmen mentioned, the insurance and the travel and the materials and the design time and the meetings, the, you know, seemingly infinite meetings um, that you have to go through for approvals and whatnot, you know, you, you don't end up making any money at all. And so, you, you know, the city of Georgetown has this awesome thing that they use in their, in their tourism marketing and people are coming to visit and cool, you know, it, yeah, it's great exposure, but we all know you can't take that to the bank. So, you know, that's, that's kind of another hang up with public art um, is, is that. Okay, gonna... Jay, I hate, I'm sorry to interrupt. Yeah. 
yeah, yeah. We gotta, um, let, let's move on. Um, we've only got a few more minutes on this part of the panel. So, okay. Um, okay. So I'd like to hear from, uh, I'd like for us to imagine for a moment a, a better way of doing things. So, and, and I wanted to start with Raisin. Um, uh, what would be a, something that would work better for all of us um, in this world? Very powerful question. I'm just going to say what comes to me first, which is going back to the very first thing that I said, which was first recognizing the vital essence or, or, or being of creatives and what we can bring to the city, to the communities. I mean, we just did Be Well, which is a project off of Lamar and Fifth Street, which Carmen also was one of the featured artists. It was a, a mental health project, right? Coming out of the pandemic. And so many people have benefited from that. I'm, we're getting calls, you know, every day of people, saying, oh, I brought my daughter, I, I brought I, I, my dad, and I was there, and I, I feel better, you know, um, people are coming outside again, like, people are taking pictures, and happy, and it's, it's gaining traction, so I, I think my answer to that would be to first recognize the fight, the importance, right, and then the second thing would be to really look at, and not just not just the actual artist, because the artist is, but the artist organization, right? <laughs> that is that are supporting. And people like to every time they say, "Hey, raising the sun, you're the artist." I mean, we're the creative organization. I'm an organizer. I'm a creative organizer. I'm here to the the downtown and the city is my canvas, right? I'm here to create opportunities for others to easily do their thing so that Carmen won't have to worry about 25 different things. <laughs> she can worry about painting that wall and Jay can work and there's a hundred percent of energy that goes into that, right? Because that's another level of production and, 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 and effort there, right? And so to understand how that all works, right? So to, to do that, you have to have conversations, you have to be in the community, you have to understand these creatives and what is this and what is that? Then looking at how we could support with funding, like funding to, 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 to where we're doing these projects and not having to worry about a paycheck or like me having to work a nine to five, right? Because Carmen and Jay, they can still do it and then say, hey, you know, we can't, I, but I have to run an organization and have a nine to five different from my organization, right? Because it, imagine if they're ignoring the artists they're sure ain't enough ignoring the organizers or the people that are curating and doing all that. So, I mean, I, this is very vital, especially with the roadmap to recovery and coming out of the pandemic. Like, this is like, we have to, get, do we need to come go to the city council? Like, do we need to, to, to lean on our, our, our stakeholders and our UT? You know, do we have to come to people that have power to be able to make things happen for us? Because we have a voice but we're only so powerful without our support system. Great, thank you. Um, Carmen, did you have anything to add? We're going to wrap up and move into the next part of the panel very quickly. But. Um, no, I, I totally agree with everything Grayson said, 100%. We just definitely need to value the arts more, put more funding in it. Um, I think maybe there's opportunity to reach out to more private sectors, um, private sponsors, donors, um, things like that, because or unless the city changes something and provides more funding. Great, thank you. Um, if it's okay with the three of you, we'll come back for questions, but I think we'll move on into uh, Rachel, Ray, uh, Rachel and Charlie. And I think we have a really natural um, segue to Rachel McGee. Um, so, Rachel, uh, the question of a union has come up several times, a union of artists, and so we're really fortunate um, to have, have Rachel here with us. 
who is um, the president of the International Association of Theatrical State um, uh, Workers. I'm sorry, I got that wrong. I always, it's IATSE. Um, uh, and, uh, and a local 205 in Austin and has been working with the opera, I believe. But um, Rachel, let's just begin with a quick check in on what you've been up to today and then um, tell us a little bit about the union and how you see that as uh, uh, contributing to arts and culture in our city. All right, well, first of all, I'll help you with the name. It's the International Alliance of Theatrical Stage Employees. Um, and actually our name is way longer than that, but we shortened it just down to that. Um, how am I doing? I'm doing good. Um, we are just starting to see a couple of little things coming back. Um, we worked uh, two gigs now um, since March. Um, actually, this is my third, my third gig, but sorry, three gigs since March, which Sounds great, but actually it only represents a total of eight weeks work since the start of this year. Um, normally I'm obviously a lot busier than that work-wise, um, but it does feel good to be back. Feels good to be, um, you know, creative work is, is always collaborative work and there's always a social aspect to it, you know, um, there's a community to attach to it and it's good to be amongst my coworkers again, and see each other. Um, I think isolation has been very hard for everybody, especially if you're used to um, a work, you know, being in some sort of work setting where you really are an integral team. Um, so yeah, I'm feeling pretty good today and I'm, I'm feeling pretty uh, inspired and blown away by a lot of the things I heard in the first part of this panel. I'm very excited about a lot of things I heard um, and I can, I, I totally get it. I'm right there with you. Uh, prior to um, getting on board with my union, all my work was freelance work. So I know exactly how everybody that's spoken feels about, you know, you're in a bidding war to get the work. And by the time you're done, you look back and you're like, did I actually earn anything? You know, and, and frequently you haven't. And um, I'm, one of the things that I say a lot to people who are interested in um, union when it comes to um, performing arts is uh, the biggest difference that being union has made to me is that since I became a union member and started my work, I've never had to freelance. I mean, I'm still a freelancer, but I've never had to 1099. Like I've ne I haven't done a 1099 contract um, and being misclassified as an independent contractor in my work since I became union. It's all been W2 employee. It's provided me a lot more stability. And uh, even through the pandemic, it provided, it provided stability. So what, um, what do you envision when you think about a future? Well, perhaps you can talk about some of the things that are on the horizon and things that might change things for all of us. In particular, I guess the pro act. <laughs> yeah, I, th I think the biggest key would be if we can get the pro act passed because um, the hardest, definitely, you know, there is a difference when you organize as a collective. Um, there's way, you just have so much more power when you are um, working as a coordinated group um, than you do as an individual. So for example, if all the artists in um, Austin came together and were able to agree, hey, when somebody bids out a job, you know, these, this is our scale. And if everybody stuck to that, you have way more power. Um, kind of the same thing in performance art, you know, with labor. Um, so, um, but one of the hardest things one, it's hard to get everybody to agree. There's a lot of misinformation, there's a lot of fear. Um, there's definitely a, uh, I think it's hardwired into um, Americans, uh, into the, I think it's in their DNA, independent. You don't want anybody telling you what to do. Uh, when you work as a group, you have to compromise and can come together. Um, so that's one aspect of it. The other part, 
the largest part that really undermines organizing is the shift in balance of power. The, the, you know, the decades that we've experienced of decades of legislation that has um, tilted the balance way more to our employers so that um, they, can, they can throw all their resources at undermining your organizing effort. I mean, at the end of the day, pretty much no employer ever wants to be organized. They, they, they have a lot of fear, um, uh, particularly, you know, the diversion of funds, as they might see it, and the diversion of their profits going somewhere else. There's a lot of fear that they won't be able to afford union labor. Um, so they will throw everything at it. And um, it's really, you know, the, the original labor, National Labor Relations Act that was set up to help or workers organize, to protect their right to organize, has just been eroded for so many years that um, it, it, it just makes it impossible. It just makes it really, really difficult um, to get workers on board because you've got this constant barrage from their employers with all their resources them know they shouldn't do it and all the reasons why they shouldn't do it. Um, so I think, you know, the PRO Act is, an, is a way to redress that balance, right? Um, so that workers can make choices without any intimidation. Thank you. Um, I think we should move on. There are a few questions for you. So I'd like to move through Charlie perhaps and then come back to you. But before we leave you, Rachel, is there a quick idea that you have aside from passing the PRO Act but, and, and the right to organize? Is there anything else you'd like to mention as a hope for the future, a change in the way that we do business or whatever, do make art? Well, I think, um... You know, it's interesting. It was interesting listening to the previous um, panelists because um, I, the art that I am involved in is performance art. And in particular, you know, I work with the opera and the ballet. And when it comes to cultural arts funding, I'm highly aware of many other groups that want, you know, access to those funds, feeling like they, they don't have, um, access um, and they often I've heard of the big three that get those get that funds and I work for two of those big three um, but I think it's important to recognize that all art is in and I think we need to be really you know as the arts community uh, needs to all of us need to come together to put some pressure um, on our community and our leaders, I agree with the same thing, like the art is important. Whatever form it is, whether it be music, performance, dance, mosaics, murals, it's all important. It is, art is the soul, right? Do we wanna live in a soulless community? And if we don't, let's find additional, because my fear right now is with the Cultural Arts Fund, it's only got one revenue stream, but our arts community and our community as a whole is growing. So there's more and more pressure on that one pot of money. And I fear that it's gonna have us bickering between ourselves. And what we really need to do is come together and go, what other revenue source can we build on? Where else can we find money? Because this is one revenue and it's, it's not sufficient. And, and everybody that spoke before, they're right that the current work model for producing art is not sustainable. Um, it's not been any creative regard, you know, whatever their art form, and it hasn't been for a long time. And interest in now in our community and fixing that, but part of it is let's get everybody on board that art is important and let's figure out where we can get additional funding. And then let's figure out how we get some kind of scale, uh, you know, of of expectation. If you want this, it's going to cost you that. No Thank quibbles. You. Thank you. Um, so next we have Charlie Lockhart. Um, and Charlie is, I, I forget, I, I've lost my introductions, which is part of my problem, but he's the um, head of Texas Folk Life. Um, and 
so I just wanted him to talk about that whole area of the arts, which we haven't examined. And again, um, the, that unpaid, largely unpaid world and how your agency works for the greater good here. Sure, hello everyone. Um, thank you, Anne. Uh, my last name is Lockwood, but don't worry, my father-in-law made the same mistake, so I won't, won't hold it against you. Um, uh, yeah, and I've noticed that a couple of my staff members are here, so I'll try to make them proud. What I thought I would do is um, um, just uh, kind of riff for a few minutes here about some of the work that we do and, um, you know, thinking a lot about uh, what everyone has already said, it's been very thought-provoking and uh, awesome just hearing the comments so far. You know, I think um, this is definitely a, a time and opportunity, uh, as Anne said, to kind of reimagine how we do things and, and thinking about what do we want to take forward from the kind of mess of the last year? What have we learned that's going to be valuable and what can we kind of leave behind? Um, so we've been grappling with... Um, a lot of things uh, since uh, the pandemic began. So I'm gonna try to share my screen here. See if I can figure this out. Okay. Can you see the, the PowerPoint here? Anyone? Yes, okay. Um, so Texas Folk Life, we're a nonprofit uh, based here in Austin. Uh, but we do work around the state of Texas. We've been um, uh, in existence since 1984. So we've had a good run here. And uh, what's been remarkable to me is just uh, sort of the changes and uh, ways we've had to adapt and um, support artists and communities we work with over 35 years now. Um, I wanna just give a quick little background and intro to this idea of folklore and folk life. Uh, you know, no, Taylor Swift did not invent this term. Uh, Folklore. She had the, the album that came out last year, caused a lot of uh, discussion. Um, but a quick, dirty overview of folklore um, it's artistic communication in small groups. Um, it's the way people make sense of the world and in community. Uh, folk life, uh, according to the American Folk Life Center, is uh, shared experience, shared everyday and intimate creativity. And so that manifests itself in a lot of different ways. And I think. Um, as an organization, it kind of comes from a time, late 70s, early 80s, where folklore, folk life was celebrated, practiced, and really pushed sort of at the national level by the NEA. Um, we've certainly had to adjust sort of um, how that has uh, been embraced and practiced by individual artists and tradition bearers and organizations over the years and are examining kind of how our role as an organization has changed. Uh, we mentioned a little bit at the beginning some of the um, impacts of the pandemic. These are some figures from Texans for the Arts. Um, and when we kind of presented these at an arts advocacy thing to our to our representatives earlier this year, they were shocked. They had not seen these numbers, you know, $2 billion in lost revenue. And then there's this other stuff here about sales tax and hotel occupancy tax, which um, uh, we've mentioned is sort of this paradigm we're in where arts uh, is valued and funding is measured by how many tourism dollars are brought in to different cities. So if you look at this from a you know, statewide level, it's pretty shocking in terms of the reductions of funding that um, as, as has been said already, you know, many artists depend on just this one source of revenue. Many arts organizations depend on that one source of revenue for funding. And uh, here in Austin, for those of you that are plugged in, you know how messy it is right now where you know, most things were cut by about 60% last year and now they don't even have the program together. You know, it's possible we may see a hundred percent cut of that fund while they kind of reimagine um, uh, themselves how they want to distribute uh, those dollars because there's also been a lot of work put into that process to make it more equitable um, so that this, those same big three or four organizations don't get all that funding every single year. I want to talk a little bit about some of our programs that have been longstanding and that we've adapted over the course of the last year or so. We have an apprenticeship program. We basically give uh, a grant to a mentor artist to train an apprentice or student in any folk arts discipline. So across the state, we have um, Bharatanatyam dancers, we have Ubuntu Abajo Sexto players, uh, accordion tuners, we have Creole fiddlers, um, cowboy arts. Uh, we've worked with hundreds and hundreds of artists over the years um, and have been developing this program as a way of um, paying the mentor artists for their time. It's not enough, um, it's never enough. We don't get enough funding to make this program work, but it's been a start. And I think um, we've, we've 
uh, notice, you know, during the pandemic, many artists, their uh, sort of uh, access to a marketplace sort of collapsed overnight. Um, music venues closing, people that are used to getting in front of people um, couldn't do that. And so we were trying to understand what role do we have to play to help uh, artists and what we're hearing a lot from the artists we work with is just more tech training, you know, more ability to do self-documentation and presentation and live stream, video capture, et cetera, to be able to do performances. So with our apprenticeship program artists, we developed this kind of um, self-documentation toolkit that many of them are using right now in our program to um, share their stories of what their traditions and arts are and how they're passing that on, how they're working with their student. Um, over the last year, we also, created a relief fund for artists. We raised and distributed about $45,000 in um, small $500, $750 uh, emergency relief grants to artists. Um, because at, when the pandemic first hit, many artists you know, were not able to access unemployment uh, insurance through Texas Workforce Commission. Um, there's a lot of barriers, structural and otherwise, that made it hard for them to do so. And so we um, were able to raise some funds through uh, public support and private support um, to be able to get some cash to, to people. And um, we're putting together kind of a, uh, uh, I guess, a presentation on where those dollars went and um, what kind of artists they supported right now. Uh, we've also done some live stream uh, projects. Uh, we do a big show at the Miller Theater in Houston every year. That's an accordion music um, uh, focus. And accordion is very important to different uh, communities and, and cultural music here in Texas, um, including uh, Zydeco from East Texas and Houston area. So uh, CJ Chenier was able to do a show with us. It was the first show he had played in, in about a year. Um, so we're hoping to get that back in person this year. We've also done some projects to help uh, different communities who we work with and artists. Um, this, will, this is an artist who did our apprenticeship program, uh, the gentleman on the right. He is a practitioner of a Micronesian uh, stick dancing practice. And he's also a retired combat army medic. And so um, what we're hearing from his community is um, the need to kind of connect um, cultural heritage to very real needs in their community. Um, and Micronesian uh, communities here in Texas, many of them have served in the US military um, because of the relationship that our country has had with the area. Um, and they, a lot of uh, these folks um, come back to uh, the United States or mainland United States, but they're not eligible for the kind of benefits that most veterans are. So we've been helping uh, them uh, on that project. Um, we've also done a lot of uh, storytelling projects with military veterans. Uh, we create a whole curriculum that's available um, as part of a NEA uh, resource center um, to do storytelling workshops with veterans. And we've done virtual projects and we're um, uh, expanding that mm -hmm. offering now this year. Um, one more thing uh, before I kind of wrap is, um, I think when we think about reimagining funding or areas of support for the arts um, beyond those typical revenue streams, what we've tried to do is look at where are the arts having a real impact on people's lives? Um, where are, are the messages and artistic forms of expression um, uh, really addressing real world problems? And so uh, with this one project, we worked with a variety of community stakeholders at the community a health level, at the artist level. Um, many of you maybe on this call were part of these initial discussions actually. Um, we partner with um, UT, Dell Med as well. Um, and the idea was to understand why and how vaccine, COVID-19 vac vaccine hesit hesitancy exists in communities to get um, feedback on what kind of messaging would be interesting and appropriate for people to uh, uh, hear about vaccine hesitancy and just other forms of uh, uh, public health and community health and safety as it relates to COVID. And so we were able to put together with artists that were interested um, a series of music video PSAs about, about COVID, about the vaccine, discussing hesitancy, discussing um, uh, why uh, uh, communities and individuals should be uh, uh, weary of COVID, et cetera. So that project is rolling out here soon. Um, We've done a bunch of storytelling projects in the community, a bunch of virtual exhibits. One thing we're working on now with um, a local um, car club um, is to examine how slab cars, show cars, low riders, et cetera, become a, a form of community cohesion, um, working on some documentation and a virtual exhibit with 
um, the Hands Full of Cash Car Club here in Austin and some of the other groups they work with and um, understanding the, the artistry and um, community building that happens in um, these kinds of uh, projects with, with show cars and slab cars. So um, I'll stop there um, and welcome any, any discussion and feedback. And if you wanna learn more about what we do or get involved, I would love to talk about partnering with, uh, with the artists that we talked with uh, at the beginning of the panel. You can check my email here and feel free to get in touch. Thanks. Okay, thank you, everyone. Um, Charlie, can you unshare? <laughs> thank you. Um, okay, um, so I think we've pretty much used our first half, um, and I, uh, I would like, if it's okay, to take only a few questions. Um, and uh, perhaps those of you that have a burning questions, um, if you could just uh, unmute yourself and or raise your hand that might be easier than curating from the chat right now anybody just we only I'll have three i'll minutes. ask i'll ask a question um i'm wondering how do you guys survive i mean i just heard all this stuff about uh, all the costs and you you're doing stuff for less than cost you're living in austin texas which is, you know, not not the cheapest place in the world. I mean, how, how do you put food on the table? Uh, I'll just quickly answer that real quick because I got to hop off in two minutes. Who, who's the young man who just answered that, asked that question? Real there's, quick? There's, there's no young man here. It's just Paul. <laughs> Hi, Paul. <laughs> Old man. <laughs> Thank you for asking that, Paul, because it's very, very, very powerful because for me, I've been in it for umpteen years. I was a school teacher forever for 15 years and that's how I was able to be stable. And then just recently getting this position with the Downtown Austin Alliance, uh, Director of Parks and Placemaking to actually do these activations and murals downtown. So I get a little bit more money, but I still have to do Raising in the Sun. You know, like I still have to do the organization. So I, I can't, I'm not, it's not able to survive right now as a grassroots organization, art organization, because it doesn't have the funding. So I have, take on something else. So it just makes you busier. So I don't know if that helped you. That's my perspective of it, if that helped answer the question. Yeah, Paul, I think, um, I think everybody has said we survive by collaboration and that's a very hard thing, um, you know, because people think of, of artists as very individualistic. But in fact, I think very few individual artists survive. Um, what interests me is that now we're seeing a, an erosion of um, public funding, a continuing erosion of public funding with the culture wars, among other things, and vast inequities in that public funding, um, the little that there is. But the quick answer is we do other things, right? You're also hearing that. So I think you have both of those uh, on an individual level. Artists are surviving by doing other things for the most part. Um, and then, um, which points to what the, the the terrible inadequacies of having every decision made by rich people, which is what's happening. People in power, rich people, make make those decisions. So I'm I'm just summarizing because I think everybody has said the same thing that that our survival is very dependent on each other and on you all. <laughs> um, other, anything else anybody would like to add? Okay, so um, I wanted to segue into, um, it may not be a lovely segue, but into Robin Moore, who's the co-chair of this panel, and he is going to present a little intermission for us um, of, of a really wonderful um, piece of music, but uh, let me let Robin um, introduce it. And then are we going to show this as a link or do we want to show it as a, um, how would you like to show this, Robin? Do you want to show it on Zoom or what, what's your sense of this? Uh, sure, we can show it on Zoom, that sounds fine. Um, yeah. I mean, so this last year, I, I guess uh, a fair bit of this later segment is going to be talking about the arts and humanities 
on the UT campus. Also, to some extent, you know, engagement with the community and what have you. But uh, I guess in various ways, COVID and the broader situation have strongly affected uh, arts and performance arts, especially here too, right? So uh, in the School of Music where I work, and it has been impossible to have a bunch of people singing together in a choir or um, tooting on wind instruments or all that stuff, which is kind of the heart and soul, I guess, of what the Butler School is. And so a lot of larger groups and even smaller groups have kind of been shut down and unable to meet at all. And the uh, student symphony, for instance, has just had a bunch of professional development talks that they've been watching on Zoom in lieu of <laughs> playing anything together. A lot of you may know that Zoom really isn't capable of coordinating sounds, uh, you know, synchronized between a lot of people sort of to create a musical event virtually, right? It isn't that sophisticated. There's all kinds of delay issues and et cetera. Um, so some of us have resorted over the last year uh, to making online music videos with Final Cut Pro and other programs uh, of that sort. Um, so essentially what that involves is creating some sort of master backtrack and then circulating it to your group members and have everybody sort of record themselves playing their individual parts and then eventually creating a video of themselves also, often separately, so you can sort of manipulate those separately, and then putting together all the component parts. Um, and we were inspired to do this by um, some members of the UT Mariachi who kind of first jumped on it. So I guess uh, what, what I was planning to show you initially was one of the early um, videos they made. Let me see if I can share this. Um, it looks like I'm... Oh. 
gives you a little idea what we've been up to uh, far from an ideal situation in terms of music making and usual uh, contact and camaraderie and things and you know, I still have to cancel that thing so I think that we, I guess we're fortunate to live in a time when we at least had some sort of technical option that sort of uh, allowed us to continue and not be in the same place. So um, we're going to move into a discussion um, or a conversation between Robin and Sid. Um, and I think their, um, their bio bios are being posted or have been posted already. Thank you. Um, but um, we're moving into the humanities now and, and, and cultural work. But I would once more like to begin just very grounded with a check-in with both of you. Um, just on how are you doing today? What are your thoughts today? Where are you um, physically? Um, you know, I just uh, wanted to begin in a very simple way. And then, uh, and then I'm going to release it to you to talk about, in particular, I think Sid has some really interesting ideas about um, where the humanities could go and where humanities education could go. I'm going to start off, Sue, by... Sure, sure. Hello, everyone. Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, uh, in terms of how I'm feeling, um, I'm doing pretty well, although I have some aches and pains, but not because of COVID. It's just certain aging processes. <laughs> um, but I, I would say that um, apropos what I'm going to be talking about, what I'm thinking about today has to do with um, graduate students that I've been working with um, and the fact that they're finishing up. I have three dissertation defenses in June and July. And I retired as of January 1st, 2020. So this brings the end um, to an end my work with doctoral students. So that's both, I'm both liberated and don't have to read any more chapters. And also um, I've loved working with doctoral students and having conversations with them. They've taught me a lot over the years. So there's a sadness in it too. So that's where I am. Thank you. Yeah, I guess I'm doing okay also. I, I feel very fortunate to have a full-time job with the state of Texas at the university and to be relatively uh, insulated from all the craziness of COVID and the job situation and the budget situation and all that. So overall, even though it's been an uncomfortable year, no, no real complaints. And um, I just wanted to add that it's been really interesting for me to 
listen to what artists are going through as they kind of interface with um, local officials and state agencies and municipal agencies and to kind of reflect on the relationship between all that and um, arts on campus and kind of the relationship of um, arts and humanistic study um, in a, a university context. On some level, I do, um, I, I guess on some level, the arts, you know, have a bit more guaranteed support at a university context in that, you know, we have our own little college of fine arts and it has a modest but relatively constant budget. Um, on the other hand, I, I definitely see similar struggles to what's been described uh, more broadly in particular ways. Um, given that a lot of uh, Republican legislatures especially tend to um, maybe not uh, see the immediate relevance of the arts and humanities and maybe would kind of prefer to see the university as a little bit more of a professional school, kind of a place where people learn particular very salable marketable trades and so on some level, we also struggle for funding and relevance and um, are engaged in some of the same discourses and um, encounter similar points of friction, maybe with uh, relative to artists and others in the community. Um, do you want me to just take things from here, Anne? Um, oh, sure. Um, you could, or um, I think you were going to move into a presentation of, of Sid's um, showing us some of her work. Yeah, yeah, let's do that. Ready? So I guess maybe what I just said could serve as a little bit of a segue. Um, I, I can talk a little bit later about my engagement with these subjects, but maybe in the same way that local artists are trying to um, convince municipal authorities of the relevance and importance of the arts and what have you, um, people engaged in the arts and humanities are trying to uh, maintain a degree of profile and relevance and stuff in the same way. My engagement with those subjects led me to um, Sidoni Smith's work on, on those topics. And so Maybe, yeah, go ahead, Susan. Tell us a little about your book and your work. Okay, thank you very much, Robin and Anne. And um, thank everybody for the previous panel. Um, it so, was so wonderful to hear about what you're doing in Austin. Um, my, my presentation will not be about an Austin context or even the UT context. It's thinking more broadly about higher education and the education of the next generations of humanists who either work in the academy or work um, outside the academy. So uh, in 2010, I, was a, I had the pleasure of being the president of the Modern Language Association, um, which is the largest uh, professional organization. Its um, uh, membership, it, uh, encompasses people who teach in the humanity in literatures and languages. And at that time, it was about 32,000 um, uh, faculty and also non academic humanists that were members of that group. And during that period, during that year, I focused my attention on. Um, what was happening with doctoral education in in uh, the humanities. And I spent the next five years working on a book on that. And it came out in uh, 16, um, a Manifesto for the Humanities. So I'm just going to um, talk very quickly about a kind of overview of what I think is the future of um, educating the next generations of academic humanists and humanists um, who will take their doctorates into other places in the workplace and become advocates for the humanities in public venues. Okay. So um, 
I'm just going to say a few things about just thinking about where we are at this historical moment in terms of what a university is and how we have to attend to what it has become so that we can understand how to educate um, uh, the next generations of humanists. So we can think about the university now as it is a distributed university. It's one at once here and elsewhere around the globe. It's mortar and code, it's structure and network. If you think about the ways in which universities now have other campuses and other areas, satellite campuses, it, it's at once bounded and permeable, it's insular and collaborative, it's open access sometimes and tuition based. It certainly has become, become corporatist, but also socially responsible in certain ways. And um, so that the university now is warped, it morphs into a conjunction of distributed nodes and networks of scholar learners. And um, then I had to think about the knowledge infrastructure, um, the infrastructure on campuses um, individually and in this network that sustains the ways in which people within the academy and all the different disciplines and certainly in the humanities um, uh, come to know what knowledge is, produce knowledge, and, um, and uh, kind of resist certain kinds of knowledge and try and make claims for new ways of seeing things. So there's been an expansion of public goods, organized and accidental. There's all this attention to small data bits and to large data sets. There's um, the kind of knowledge in infrastructure includes hardware, software, humans, network, device, and the cloud. And there's a range of relationships of people in the academy to the digital, the realm of the digital and to algorithms. Um, some work is digitally assisted. Uh, some is focused on digital cultures. Some is digitally environed. That means it lives in the digital environment. Some of it is born digital and um, begins there. Um, and so in this environment, um, uh, future faculty and certainly now um, both undergraduates and graduate students um, have to adjust um, to the multiple identities that they um, experience in this environment and the multiple skills and capacities they need to develop or to hone so they're successful in this environment. Um, and uh, then there's a new ecology of scholarly communication on campuses. Um, this is particularly important for people who are in book fields and a lot of humanists are in books, they think about producing books, uh, but we're moving from the print system to this system that is sometimes identified as the shape-shifting scholarly communication environment. Um, people are producing work in multimedia and on different kinds of platforms. Um, those platforms are used for organizing knowledge, for visualizing um, intellectual exchange. And so we might say we're moving to a time of bookishness and sort of publishing. That is sometimes people can mount um, on their websites, their, their academic websites, um, in process work, in process work and invite responses to it. Uh, it's interactive. And so in this environment, um, it, which is radically different from what it was even 20 years ago. Um, uh, faculty in the humanities and graduate students in the humanities and undergraduates in the humanities have to begin to understand how they can produce work over multiple platforms, how it circulates, how to network, and how to curate their own work. And um, we also have a new environment of open access communication, um, which for some of us is very threatening in a way. It's, uh, it, it seems a little dicey to put your work out in open access journals where anybody can go and get to it. But for others of us, and I consider myself one of them, open access seems to me very important. It's a way for humanists to get their work to larger publics. Um, and so in order to do that, um, 
future generations of humanists in the academy and elsewhere need to have some kind of un understanding of what open, publishing open access means, about what Creative Commons licenses are, how do you get how do you get the rights to your own work? How do you get the rights to your own work back? And they need to understand kind of how things can sit out in, um, in virtual spaces and uh, people can be uh, responding to the work and the work can shift and morph as those responses are incorporated into later versioning of work. Um, uh, so I'm going to um, skip this. What I want to just focus on for the rest of my talk is um, uh, a t what I see as an important way to transform doctoral education in the humanities going forward. And I've made this argument, um, uh, I made this argument in the book, but I've also been thinking of it since that book was published. And what do we need to do to um, uh, create a, uh, a structure, a doctoral, doctoral programs that are adequate to all the things that students need to have uh, at hand, all the understanding they need of infrastructure, of new uh, modes of scholarly communication, um, of new ways of, of circulating knowledge. So um, here are some of the components. I'm just going to go through these quickly. I think it's important to structure a, a fluid and elastic and flexible praxis-based co-curriculum. Um, and that means that uh, programs would do well to uh, develop a, a set of activities that students do as they move through their coursework and doing their dissertation that are based in praxis. For instance, um, uh, an introduction to doctoral study in which students um, uh, have to learn what it is that the department understands as intellectual work, how that work is done, um, and what they should be thinking about in terms of the end product of that work, which is usually called the dissertation. And maybe um, a prospectus, they have to write prospectus, a pr prospectus for their dissertation. Um, they're often at sea doing that. So a praxis element of doctoral education might be a mini course or a colloquium tied to developing that thesis. Um, perhaps writing cohort groups. So students are put together with members of their cohorts as they're working on their um, large project so that they have a support system that helps them advance through that process. That's one. The other thing is that we need to expand the kinds of activities and projects and assignments we ask of, of students in their graduate work. So different kinds of courses, different kinds of papers. Usually um, in the humanities, the common paper is a long paper of about 25 pages. But what if we did um, ask them to write something for the public on some aspect of the work they're doing for the course? What about if we put them together in collaborative teams? More, uh, even in the humanities, there's going to be more collaborative work going forward. And so we need to give our students um, uh, opportunities to be able to de develop their skills of collaborating with other emerging scholars. So th that's new kinds of coursework. And then um, we have to spend time developing with them an understanding of the um, new ecology of scholarly communications that I just talked about. And we need to support students as they expand the repertoire of capacities that are requisite to careers in and outside the academy. Um, so it means thinking about in order to do the kind of projects they want to do, suppose they want to do some work in the public humanities and they want to do some collaborative work. Well, they need to learn how to manage a team, perhaps to write grants, perhaps to get some techno not technological, basic technological uh, knowledge about putting together code, 
Um, they might want to learn a new language. They might want to do an internship in uh, a, a publishing house. Um, so we need to work with them purposefully to understand what they need as they're moving forward toward the job market and what they already bring with them and how to continually be taking an inventory of all the skills and capacities they are developing. And then in the book, uh, my major focus is on changing the notion of what is expected of something called the, the final project, the dissertation, which is in the humanities normatively a kind of book length work. And so I call for a, a loosening up of the hold of that one form so that students can imagine alternatives to a proto monograph that's called the proto book, a first draft of a book, um, by being able to do sets of essays or various ensembles where they might write for different audiences, um, a translation project with a um, meta narrative about um, the theorizing of translation itself, documentary films, um, born digital multimedia projects. So that's just some of the possibilities for moving forward. So what I see this is uh, these, this kind of transformation as enabling is to give students a sense, a, a deeper sense of their own agency in moving through their program. Uh, it reorients the notion of success instead of thinking the only successful students are those who go on and be, get tenure track positions. It opens up and says the success is uh, whatever you define it as, as your goals in doing this work in the humanities. And it also expands the notion of the community of humanists, because I think sometimes um, we think uh, of academic humanists as the only humanists out there. But there are so many humanists out in the humanities workforce. And the, there's an entity called the Humanities Indicators that talks about the humanities workforce and talks about the, all the different kinds of jobs that um, students that come out with undergraduate degrees, master's degrees, and doctoral degrees do that is advocating and impacting um, various careers, various uh, communities, various environments with humanistic um, values and co modes of inquiry and um, excitement and imagination in a ma and kind of being able to imagine the world otherwise. Um, so what I see this as the importance of transforming the doctoral degree and um, the way in which we can do different kinds of things with the undergraduate degree is that we are um, preparing gifted advocates for humanistic learning and inquiry both across the university and before and with the public. So with that, I'll stop. And then I think there are other things we're going to be talking about. Thanks, Robin. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Sid. Yeah. Uh, so. We do have a question in the chat that I, I would love to get to. And sure. um, if that's okay, Robin. Sure. Um, which is um, from Charlie. Um, where does the transformation of doctoral training start at the department level at the dean's office with provost, <laughs> regents, chancellor? I've personally seen how out of touch departments can be with job training their students need to get a job outside academia. And um, to that, I might add the question, which is kind of in line of funding yeah. question. We know that graduate education um, in the humanities is funded at a much lower level than um, funding provided for graduate students in say engineering and that in fact, um, there's a very strong organization at UT called Underpaid at UT um, with many graduate students in the humanities fighting for some kind of decent way of life. So how do we do all those things? Um, let me just take a, 
a quick bite at that or did you want to respond robin no please go ahead okay first of all um uh I'm at the University of Michigan, and the fortunate thing here is we both we have a lecturers union and we have a graduate students union. So um, uh, that's one of the ways in which um, uh, changes can be made around the issue of um, compensation um, uh, for or the the packages for graduate students. On the other. Uh, but I recognize that that's not all that many um, campuses are, or, are unionized in that sense. So I recognize that um, issue. Um, on the thing about where does it start? I mean, sometimes I get very depressed about certainly where it doesn't start. And it often is very difficult to get um, your own colleagues, like my own colleagues, um, uh, energized about making changes, but there are changes going on uh, in doctoral education across the country and in some very exciting ways. And there's a lot of information out there on various websites. Um, and our professional organizations also have a lot of material on both experiments that are going on and also um, uh, reports on doctoral education. I think um, uh, I, I was going in the, in the book for a large change, the change of the dissertation. That is not the place to start. The place to start, I think, is thinking about uh, what I call the, and a lot of places are doing this, what I call the praxis curriculum, to think about ways to engage doctoral students so that they become self-reflexive of what each stage that they're going through, and they begin to see themselves as agents in each of those stages. Um, because many graduate students come in, um, just um, uh, they think everybody else in their cohort understands what is going on or what the dissertation is or what they should be doing by the end of the year. But everybody um, is, uh, kind of um, hamstrung if faculty in their courses and in the kinds of programs they do, they put on, aren't talking directly about each stage of doctoral study. What is expected of students? How much can they push back? How can they get as many mentors? How can they find mentors for their interests in other areas of the university? And I think that is a place that um, people can start experimenting. And certainly faculty can start experimenting with new kinds of courses and new kinds of um, assignments and expectations on what students are going to be doing in those courses. Thank you for that question. Yeah, maybe I should just mention that, uh, I mean, there's been a tremendous, so Sedoni has contributed greatly to it, but there's a tremendous literature on kind of rethinking right. university programs and curricula and uh, uh, crises facing the university systems and all this kind of thing. So I guess one thing that, you know, local artists and, and those in higher education kind of have in common uh, is kind of a a, crisis, a job crisis, a money crisis, et cetera, right? So on some level, there's been a lot of complacency, I guess, in university context, and it's really only the last 15 years or something, I guess, since the 2008 economic crisis, when suddenly a lot of jobs have disappeared and a lot of budgets have been kind of reduced um, to the extent that uh, it's hard to fund graduate students, it's hard to place graduate students when they get done, um, and so folks have had to think hard about how we really offering what students need. Um, are they doing something relevant? Are they going to be able to sort of engage with communities and stuff when they're done? And so um, I guess, you know, money and jobs in both spheres have kind of engendered a lot of conversations about kind of how to relate to that, how to improve the situation, et cetera. Um, 
let me just share real briefly kind of the extent to which uh, the ways I've engaged with um, some of these issues. I guess the first thing that, so I got kind of interested in curricular issues and I must say kind of relative to the first half of the panel to the second, I kind of view my area of ethnomusicology as sort of sitting between the two in that you know, we have academic training and we sort of do humanistic stuff. We're expected to publish, but a lot of us also are trained as performers and lead performance groups and interact with community members on that basis and stuff. So we have a little bit of a foot in both worlds. Um, and so I got increasingly interested, you know, being part of a large music school that is kind of based on a 19th century conservatory model and offers, you know, harp classes and huge choral works and you know things that maybe, you know, maybe resonate strongly with certain members of the community, but maybe, you know, don't have the same public that, you know, Conjunto or Country Western or whatever else might have in the Austin area. And um, so I think increasingly with this again, financial, financial crisis, job crisis, uh, there's been a race for relevance, even people that are very engaged with a very uh, sort of emotionally committed to what uh, performing arts programs are at universities have hard to, had to really think them through again and wonder whether they're doing the best thing for their students and kind of where, where the future lies. Um, and they're just, you know, implicitly schools like the University of Texas are trying to, uh, they're training massive numbers of people on, we're sort of a trade school, right? We're sort of uh, putting all this energy into technical expertise on the oboe or the cello or something with the implicit expectation that folks are going to go out and get symphony jobs or uh, university teaching jobs or something and to suddenly there aren't that many positions like that so all of that has engendered tremendous amounts of introspection and finger pointing and uh, debate so as somebody from a discipline that is very interested in global music making and also different kinds of traditional music making folkloric music making um I sort of wanted to offer the perspective of the discipline on kind of what music programs could be. So um, that edited book project suggested a few areas where uh, music programs, university-based music programs could uh, place greater emphasis. One big area was kind of commitment to community, which is something that has been sorely lacking. So in that kind of paradigm, students would um, spend more time in the community, learn the kind of music that's going on there, uh, collaborate and incorporate academic projects that research the histories of particular artists and that kind of thing, and would obviously rely heavily on institutions like the one uh, Charlie leads and others, and, and uh, uh, in that way sort of foster relevance and uh, goodwill and greater communication and that sort of thing in ways that haven't existed before. Um, there were some other priorities too, like uh, global awareness or a commitment to issues of social justice and anti-racism. That, that's kind of been off the table in most music schools, not even thought about, but clearly, <laughs> uh, especially in the current environment, it's starting to raise its head uh, and thankfully so. Um, greater emphasis on student agency and creativity. Um, that's always a toughie in institutions because we're so siloed and uh, rigid in general in terms of kind of what we conceive of in terms of an education. Um, anyway, there's some others, but that, um, that was kind of my initial foray and it had to, it, it was derived out of a, a seminar. And then a little bit more recently, um, I 
did another iteration of the seminar. Can you see this Word document or is that invisible on your screen now? Okay, let me see if I can bring that up. I did another iteration of the seminar where we focus specifically on the discipline of ethnomusicology. One of the things that we, um, um, one of the things that really struck me looking at literature on arts and humanities at universities was that um, more established fields like the Modern Languages Association or the American Historical Association had all kinds of data on where people were getting jobs and how much they were earning and um, how people thought about their education in retrospect after they were finished and sort of issues like that. And we had nothing, our field, I guess it just is too small and we hadn't invested the kind of uh, energy in that sort of thing. So um, the first part of the essay covers a lot of literature related to sort of challenges to education and potential solutions, including those uh, that Sid, uh, Sidoni just mentioned. And then the we talked and then we focused in in the second half on our particular discipline and talked about levels of financial support among students, for instance, um, time to degree in our particular discipline, what that looked like relative to others, um, job placement rates. And we took a close, we took a real specific dive into our program here at the University of Texas to see how effective we were being and where people were going and how many were getting a university related thing or more broadly arts related position, et cetera, or were entirely out of the field. Um, we did a lot of interviewing with faculty and students about issues that they recognized things that they liked or didn't like about their degree and discussed that sort of thing, issues of student debt. Uh, and I guess one of the most disturbing data points was about jobs since 2008. We wanted to sort of take a look at that vis-a-vis -vis kind of the field of um, kind of where things were headed. And um, so this is kind of basically since 2005, these are yeah, tenure track, non-tenure track, and postdoc positions. But um, yeah, as of 2020, things really nosedived. And so this is the kind of situation that um, arts and humanities programs are facing as they figure out how many uh, students they want to have any particular time or how they should be training them or what kind of skills they need going forward or how they should be informed about alternative careers beyond academia, that sort of thing. Um, so it's a, it's a complicated situation. Robin, um, that's very depressing. So what would you see? I know that the state of Texas funds the University of Texas at what, 15% or something of it? Yeah, more like 11 or 12. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's really um, for a public institution. And so we're very reliant on corporate funding. How would you see things changing uh, for a better um, outcome for students and, and I suppose faculty? Yeah, well, I'm sure Sidoni has uh, ideas about this too. And her, her books and publications suggest a lot of them. I guess, you know, clearly um, programs need to downsize and have been, um, they need to support the smaller number of students better that they are supporting. Um, and then the kinds of training and the focus, I would say, and programs need to be reconceptualized. Um, I, I would say there needs to be a focus on, a, on public scholarship, on training with things like website design and video editing and um, all sorts of tools that kind of allow people to project what they're doing into different spheres and to reach broader audiences than have been the case before. Um, as Sidoni mentioned, there's also been a lot of emphasis on uh, focusing on issues of broad relevance within particular regions. Right. Um, and thinking about, you know, what can the arts contribute to or the humanities scholarship contribute to topics like immigration or climate change or 
water shortages and I mean these sorts of issues right um, and how if if it's possible to uh, directly engage with pressing topics like that how can the arts contribute what can we how can we work with you know partners in the community and across campus to do something that uh, is really understood to be of fundamental importance and in that way sort of maintain our our profile and relevance and a place on campus. I, I'd like to add a couple, may I add a couple of things to yeah. that? Um, uh, I think, uh, I mean, this goes back to the, the question um, uh, about, that came out of the, the, the kind of um, uh, recognition that it's hard to get people to change in departments, but, there are, uh, there are such exciting programs going on around the country. And one of the places a lot of the energy is coming out of is humanities institutes. Now, not every place has a humanities institute, but there is a, um, there are some ones that are experimenting with new things. So um, the one at the University of Iowa uh, is, uh, is doing, um, uh, a humanities, it's a new doctorate program, an interdisciplinary doctoral program called Humanities for the Public Good, an integrative collaborative practice-based humanities PhD. And I think that speaks um, to what Robin was just saying. Um, Kathy Woodward, who's, who's director of the Simpson Center at the University of Washington, also, um, uh, work to introduce a graduate certificate program in the public humanities. And there's another entity called um, Humanities Without Walls, funded by the Mellon uh, Foundation um, now for about eight years. Um, it's the consortium of the big Midwest universities. Um, and it's um, seeds uh, collaborative work that puts people from the different universities together in the humanities uh, around issues that are regional issues. And so a colleague of mine in English just got um, a, a grant from the Humanities Without Walls um, for um, uh, a, a development of a project focused on learning from and coordinating water-centered humanistic public engagement efforts in the Great Lakes region. Um, and I think um, th that's from a person in the department who was chair for many years. He's an 18th century scholar, but he's also very interested in these large, um, uh, in kind of how, how the community, how the humanities and arts can speak to these broad urgent issues that we're confronting. So, um, I mean, I've got, I went out and did some poking around. So there's just, uh, there's a lot going on um, that is trying to um, move humanist and, and the programs in the humanities in ways that are very innovative and um, uh, um, have the potential to draw a broader um, diversity of students into doctoral studies in the humanities and arts um, at the arts level and, um, and also to shift the sense of what a successful degree is. What's the, what is success in humanities education? Um. Yeah, thank you so much. I think we should open up for brief uh, question and answer period. Um, if people have questions, we have about five minutes. And then um, one of the things that occurs to me is how appropriate this is uh, as an ending for this institute um, in terms of uh, this look at work and the future of work and um, in particular, in a way we could see the whole Institute as an exercise and collaboration across um, questions of human endeavor. So I, um, I wanna leave some time for that as well. But first questions, anybody who might have questions? 
just to unmute yourself and ask. Any questions? Okay, I'm going to turn it over to Karen and Neville then. Thank, and I wanna thank everyone so much um, for being part of this panel. Well, you should ask right. your question. Okay, I actually had a question. <laughs> so I'm going to abuse my position as the, having the last word to ask the question. I mean, what, what can I mean? Yeah, I teach in an English department. So a lot of what was said in the second half of this panel was sort of achingly, uh, experientially familiar. Like, what am I training my graduate students for? Um, they're going to write a dissertation, but it, well, they're probably not going to, some of them, a few of them are going to get tenure track jobs. It's not really a proto monograph at all. Um, but I wonder what happened, what happens to the disciplines or what happens to departments when all the energy goes into interdisciplinary humanity centers. And so I think there's, 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 I mean, I think the pro in the in this moment of austerity, there's the risk of certain kinds of self-cannibalizing. And I'm also interested, I mean, so, so like Chris Newfield's thing is we need to grow demand, uh, not restrict supply. So, so I mean, I suppose there, there's two questions. It's like, I want to keep doing what we do well, even if, even if it's kind of like unpopular. And then what are the, um, and then the big question for me is how do we make better public arguments for the value of the humanities? And I think that's a, that's a question that's beyond the reach of, maybe it isn't. I mean, how do, what, how do we tie new forms of graduate training? And also there's something, I mean, I, innovation is a word that makes me very uncomfortable. Because it looks to me like this is just a straight, it could be a straight slide into sort of neoliberal, uh, self responsibilizing. Um, you know, it, it's, it's sort of a corporate speak word. And I think part of the problem with universities that actually our rhetoric and our practices have become increasingly corporate. So I suppose I'm asking a question about what public good in education and public good in the humanities. And I think it's there, I mean, and public good in the arts. I mean, raise it sort of, you know, I'm a little bit more cynical. I don't, I don't necessarily think the arts, arts is the heartbeat, but that I'm not an artist. But I mean, what, what are the kind of public arguments around public good that we can make for the humanities and the arts? Yeah, I guess one approach is to maybe start with issues that are really, uh, pressing to particular communities, right? We try to base some of our scholarship and activities around that, you know? I guess one of the things we tend to be battling is the, the idea that, at least on campuses, the kinds of arts and humanistic study that happen are elitist and kind of out of touch and they don't have a lot to do with what folks in the community are interested in. So maybe some of that dialogue needs to happen first and maybe even more collaborative work of particular kinds needs to uh, take place and if we sort of reconceive the the beginning and the impetus maybe that would have a positive effect in terms of kind of perceptions of what we do and uh, audience for what we do and i think um i mean there's all kinds of of things to be done one of the um, I, I don't quite take your point about humanities institutes being a, the location of interdisciplinarity, although they are, because I came from, a, I come from two departments that are very interdisciplinary. So I don't see departments as non-interdisciplinary vis-a-vis humanities institutes. That's just a sidebar conversation. But um, um, quite a few, <laughs> back to the humanities institutes. I think one of the interesting things to make the case for the humanities to a larger public um, is coming about through all the humanities festivals that are going on now across the country. 
I don't know whether you have one in, in Austin, but um, the, the Humanities um, Festival in Chicago is huge. And there's one in Pittsburgh, and there's one now in Cleveland. Um, Case Western Reserve is the one, the, the Humanities Center there is um, taking the lead on putting together all in these different venues in Cleveland, bringing the humanities to the general public and the arts. Um, same in Pittsburgh, uh, Iowa City. Um, so I think uh, um, there's ways that, and I've had, uh, um, the, the Humanities Festival in Chicago uses faculty from a lot of the big universities in the Chicago area and in the Midwest and faculty go and they talk about their own projects, not, they don't, aren't kind of um, directing their projects to, some, to something they think the audience would like, but they're asked to present in a very open way, you know, with only the limited notes. And um, there's huge audiences on whatever people are talking about. So, um, uh, so I think there are things to do um, uh, in the communities. Um, I think things are happening in terms of public, the pu public humanities, public humanities, the, the uh, scholarship and inquiry projects that are going on um, with students, a lot of students in the humanities interested in doing public humanities work. Um, so I'm not quite as um, uh, suspicious about uh, talking to the, you know, uh, uh, kind of trying to pursue venues in which one can have conversations across the divide between the academy and um, different kinds of publics. Although I must say, I was telling Robin, there's a very chastening, um, a, a, an interesting but chastening a report that just came out about six months ago from the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. They did a big survey of the public and their attitudes towards the humanities. So I recommend that anybody in the humanities read that report. It's very interesting. Um, and I'm sorry to interrupt, but I think um, I think Neville's getting at something in addition, um, yeah. which is this division between um, what I would call, you know, manual and uh, intellectual work, um, and the Dis distance between um, what is seen as, um, you know, work for the public good. How do we know what is good work for the public good when the, what the public good is, is in the hands of agencies like the National Endowment for the Humanities, which I watched transform from a fairly progressive organization into the most conservative. Right. Well, um, a reactionary organization. Why would the public, um, you know, and, and these people that somehow think the humanities have something to do with reading endlessly the American constitution, the US constitution or something of that sort. Um, and I think that the other question here that I think is really important that Rachel actually raises is certainly the opera in, uh, in a different context was not uh, the world of the elite. Um, you know, this is not something that we have to deny um, right. in terms of thinking of certain parts of the arts world as appropriate for communities and other parts not. The question always is access and who funds it and who is it for? Um, you know, and I think that was part of the first part of the panel very strongly. So I think Neville's raising some very important points about why, what is the impulse? If the impulse is to try to deal with, with the um, lack of funding for these things, then let's deal with the lack of funding for these things rather than distorting what's actually happening in the academy. Right, well, well, is, that, is that kind of what you were getting at? Uh, are you asking Neville? Yes. Well, no, I mean, I was just, I mean, this is, this is, this is a huge and long conversation. And 
Yeah. We're, at, we're at the end of a, a fantastic, fantastic two-hour panel. Um, so I, I'm interested. I mean, I think venue is important. Um, but I'm also trying to think, of like, why do you, I mean, I think, I think we're in a public sphere where there is currently an impoverishment of arguments around pub, what is the public good. I think we live in an ideological world where an idea of a public good is severely eroded. And I mean, and, and I mean, just the statistics, okay, 11, we, we teach in a public university, 11% or whatever the figure is, I know it's below 20, comes from um, the, the state legislature. So I just, so I just, I just kind of think, I'd like to try and connect these arguments we're making about the humanities to, um, I mean, there's lots of people doing it in the language of the commons. Um, but anyway, I don't want to take up time. You were rare. Everybody was really, really terrific. I learned a hell of a lot from this panel and you've been unbelievably patient. It's been two hours. They've been a great two hours. So Karen's just going to say goodbye to you. And <laughs> thank you to everybody who's been part of this pop-up. It nearly killed me, but it was also fantastic. So thank you. Uh, and I, I'll just add the thanks. And I, this, we had thought about having a closing event, but when this turned out to be on this Friday, we thought we don't need a closing event because we knew that it would cover so much. Um, and for those of you who have been with us for the last three weeks, you could see the return and the juggling of issues, but um, I really, really love that we had um, these really sort of, well, we had multiple conversations, but I love the way in which, and you did a terrific job of bringing together um, the two parts. So both of which are related in so many ways we could continue to talk about as well. Um, so I guess we should officially, you know, close the pop-up, but since we didn't have the official closure, I want to say, um, you know, also that we're going to, we want to keep the conversation going and we will keep the conversation going even by through the videos, putting you all in conversation with people you didn't know you were in conversation with. So um, we're going to connect you all to each other as well as to others who have spoken throughout the time. Um, we're going to keep working on the website. We love um, suggestions that people have, um, resources you want to send us. Uh, we really want to have this be a living, ongoing conversation as it needs to be. Um, and again, thanks for bringing us back to our own work, um, our own work sites here at the end. Um, so that's it. And thanks to you too as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.